Hello, my name is Joshua Shipp. I'm a biology professor at Antelope Valley College. And I recently gave this talk, Birth Control Through the Ages, as part of the third annual environmental summit at Antelope Valley College. And um, there was a request to make an online recorded version of this talk. So that's what this is. As part of my experience of teaching almost 10 years at Antelope Valley College, I teach a number of subjects, including environmental biology, which is very important to me. So one topic that I really wanted to cover as part of the summit was a topic of traditional methods of birth control and, and why they're important. So I want to start by quoting from Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. And as you'll see, the last part of this quote is relatively well known, but I wanted to give a little bit more of this quote for context. So this is Thomas Hobbes describing humans living outside of civilization who don't have a strong governmental system. He wrote, they are in that condition which is called war. There is no place for industry, no culture of the earth, no navigation, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So that last phrase is pretty well known, and a lot of people still quote from this section of Leviathan. And you might be wondering, why does this matter? Why does this book from hundreds of years ago matter today? But I would argue that this this viewpoint of hunter-gatherer societies, of small-scale societies, is still with us today. And a lot of people base their overall understanding of hunter-gatherers and small-scale societies by this, this viewpoint. And just to show you this, this is a, an article from The Economist in 2007, and they wrote, constant warfare was, was necessary to keep population density down to one person per square mile. Farmers can live at a hundred times that density. Hunter-gatherers may have been so lithe and healthy because the weak were dead. The invention of agriculture and the advent of settled society merely swapped high mortality for high morbidity, allowing people some relief from chronic warfare so they could at least grind out an existence rather than being ground out of existence altogether. So I would say this is basically just an extension of Hobbes' argument um, from hundreds of years earlier. So I think in our society, there's this widespread belief that hunter-gatherers in the past and maybe those that continue to exist are primitive, violent, starving, powerless, constantly dying, and that these societies were small. These societies had small population sizes because of really high levels of starvation, high mortality, and because of suffering inherent in their way of life. Not to give too much of a spoiler here, but all of this is rubbish. This evaluation of hunter-gatherer groups is not actually supported by evidence. So let's see where the evidence actually takes us if we evaluate um, studies of real hunter-gatherer groups. So in this talk, I will first make the argument that it is birth control and not starvation that was the important mechanism by which uh, hunter-gatherer groups maintain themselves at low population density. And then we're going to do a survey through traditional practices of birth control around the world. And then I'm going to talk about why this is important, why birth control uh, is important for population regulation of these societies and why it also matters to us in our, our current world. <clears throat> so unlike what Hobbes thought, Hunter-gatherers historically and today have been shown to have lifespans similar to those of agricultural groups. So in this study where they looked at hunter-gatherer groups of the past and also modern hunter-gatherer groups, they were comparing the modal age of death, so that the age that is most commonly uh, found for people, for adults that die, but they also gave you the percent of adults deaths at or above the mode. So this is kind of giving you what chunk of the overall population dies at or above this modal uh, number. 
So you could see that for hunter-gatherer groups, there's a lot of variation here, both historically as well as in modern hunter-gatherer groups. But these numbers are pretty much in line with what you'd find in um, you know, modern, relatively modern agricultural industrialized Sweden from the 1750s. And in fact, many hunter-gatherer groups have longer lifespans than what would be associated with this exclusively agricultural group. So there's not, as you would predict, a much lower lifespan associated with hunter-gatherers. And these hunter-gatherer groups typically have better nutrition, better health, and a lower incidence of famine compared to purely agricultural groups. Like in this study from 2015, you can see the jaw of a hunter-gatherer on the left, and both of these are from, I think, thousands of years ago. In this jawbone from a hunter-gatherer group, the jaw is much thicker. And this is for a few reasons, because of better nutrition, more protein in the diet, and also more chewing of their food. The jaws of hunter-gatherers tended to be much um, thicker and could really support all of the teeth, um, kind of correctly aligned. Whereas for agricultural groups, poor nutrition and less chewing in their way of life caused the jawbones to be much thinner and more flimsy and could not readily support all of the teeth. So there was a lot of malformation of, of teeth and misalignment. So what the literature shows you is that these societies, hunter-gatherer groups, had small populations not because of widespread suffering, not because of really high mortality or starvation, but because of low fertility associated with widespread traditional practices of birth control, which I'm going to survey um, in the next few slides. So in this study from 2016, they compared fertility, mortality, and overall reproductive output for hunter-gatherer groups, which they have here kind of in this mustard yellow, versus agricultural societies, which is in blue. And as you can see for fertility, there is much lower fertility associated, associated with hunter-gatherer groups. Mortality is actually a little bit lower so hunter-gatherers tend to have a little bit greater survival in this analysis compared to purely agricultural societies. But because this fertility is much lower, that means that overall reproductive output, overall number of, of offspring produced each year would be much lower in um, hunter-gatherer groups compared to in um, agricultural societies. So let's take a brief survey through the various traditional methods of birth control found all around the world. And we're going to start with a really important one. So extending breastfeeding is a very common cultural practice that has the effect of reducing birth rate. And the way that it does this is that it tends to return, delay the return of ovulation. And as you can see in this graph here, this is showing different durations of extended breastfeeding. So in this particular analysis, going beyond two years. And this has the effect, on average, to delay the onset of ovulation. And in other studies, um, ovulation can even be extended for two or even three years or longer. Whereas in this study, it kind of goes up to a maximum of about uh, two years. So this is really common all around the world. So for example, in many rural regions in India, like this village from Northwest India, it's common for women to breastfeed for longer than two years. Women of Tibet, as well as the San women of the Kalahari Desert, both of them traditionally breastfeed for three years or longer. The Mbuti people of Central Africa really kind of take this to an extreme, though. They breastfeed for five years or longer, and anthropologists have noted that it's not uncommon to find children who are seven, eight, or nine years old occasionally breastfeeding with their mothers. So they really have you know, extended breastfeeding as an effective means of, of birth control within these societies. Besides extending the length of uh, breastfeeding, another very effective way of reducing pregnancy is to completely refrain from having sex. And a lot of cultures have developed this practice of after you have a birth of a new child, they go through a period 
where they will not um, have sex with each other within the couple. So that's called postpartum abstinence. And as you can see in this graph, this is a relatively widespread practice. And there's variation for how long this abstinence period lasts, but in some cases it extends longer than a year. So let's take a look at some groups that use this method. This is a very common method of traditional birth control throughout Africa. So there are you know, literally hundreds of examples I could go through from Africa, but for one example, on coastal villages of Zanzibar off the coast of Tanzania, women will sleep apart from their husbands and refrain from sex with them for two years or longer after birth, including this village shown on the right from Zanzibar. In the Grand Valley Dani people of New Guinea, this abstinence period after birth stretches for five or six years. And anthropologists who studied this uh, indigenous group of New Guinea also noted an overall reduction in sex drive, which makes sense that if you had a reduction in, in sex drive, that could go alongside um, having such a long abstinence period. <clears throat> So now we turn to condoms. And I think condoms are a very interesting example because I think there's a common perception that they're a modern invention, but in fact, they've been around for thousands of years. Many of the earliest condoms were made out of animal parts, particularly intestines or gallbladders. So for example, on the left here, this is a sheepskin condom from England dating back to about 1640 AD. And on the right, this is a a sheep intestine condom that was very popular around the turn of the century, 1900s uh, England. Condoms made out of animal parts were also common in ancient Persia, where you know, scholars would write about their practice in Renaissance Europe and possibly ancient Rome and Greece. There's some disagreement among scholars about how common this practice was in those ancient civilizations, but there is some evidence that authors there knew about the practice of creating condoms out of animal parts. But just to show you a more recent example, this is Casanova at a sex party um, dating back to his, he lived in 18th century Italy. And in this picture, you can see the men at the sex party inflating condoms, kind of like balloons, and they would have used a condom similar to this. So this is an actual intestine-based condom from the 18th century that would have been similar to what Casanova would have used. Condoms could also be made out of fabric like silk or linen, and these were common in ancient Egypt and in China. In Egypt, condoms were colored to signify social class. So in, on the hieroglyphics on the left here, you can see the application of these linen condoms. And on the right, this is a preserved uh, Egyptian condom that, that was made out of fabric. Condoms could also be made out of other materials. So for example, in Japan, they had these rigid condoms that were made out of tortoise shell, which they called kabuto gata. So here's an example dating back from the 19th century. On the right here, this is also a really interesting example. This is a condom made out of silver and gold that was used by the ancient Anatolian civilization who lived in what is now modern day Turkey. Okay, so this dates back to 2500 BC. And indigenous peoples, hunter-gatherer groups also constructed condoms. So for example, the Jukas tribe of New Guinea crafted condoms out of plant materials. Okay, so another very common form of birth control across the world is by using herbs, using herbal contraception. And scientists have come to realize that hunter-gatherer groups had extensive knowledge, sophisticated knowledge of their local plants and the medicinal qualities associated with their plants. And that includes plants that have the effect of preventing pregnancy or aborting unwanted pregnancy. And the literature that I've read suggests that in the past, scientists were very skeptical about the herbal concoctions and teas made by different tribal groups and thought these probably are not particularly effective. But over the last couple decades, scientists have started to investigate these herbs more and more and found that they do actually have significant contraceptive effect. So I created this table here, primarily based on these two review studies 
that, that I've cited. And what I've done is I've listed a number of plants that have contraceptive qualities and have grouped them by how they affect um, reproductive output. How do they affect birth rate? So there are plants that suppress ovulation, the release of an egg, those that affect sperm, so either reducing sperm motility or sperm, sperm number, preventing implantation of a fertilized egg into a wall of the uterus, and abortifacient, or chemicals which induce abortion. So all of these plants I've listed here, and if you go to these uh, studies, you can find more citations. These are all plants that have traditionally been used by indigenous cultures around the world for contraception, and they have all been investigated by scientists and shown to have the listed effect. So all of these are actually have actually been documented scientifically to be effective uh, herbal contraception. So let's go through a few examples of these herbal forms, forms of contraception. So for example, the plant rue has been brewed into a tea that's an effective abortifacient. And this uh, brew tea was commonly used in ancient Greece and Rome. So for example, Pliny the Elder, the, the ancient Roman author, he promoted rue tea as a, a way of inducing abortion and regulating population. Rue tea was also used throughout India and in many Native American groups, including the Aztecs and Mayans. In Paraguay today, traditional herbal contraception is more widespread than any other form of birth control. And if you go to markets in Paraguay, you'll find a number of herbs called yuyos that have various types of medicinal quality, including herbs that have contraceptive quality. And these have been shown to be effective. Australian Aborigines used a number of native plants to prevent or end pregnancy, including the, the quinine tree on the left here, as well as the giant borelip orchid. And these plants were used, for example, by the Aborigines of Queensland, Australia. And on the right here, we can see some modern examples of these Aborigines from Queensland. Okay. So besides the methods I've talked about, there are many other methods that are commonly used, including the rhythm method, where uh, women will basically figure out the timing of their ovulation to determine what part of the month they are um, less susceptible to pregnancy. This method is common all around the world and, for example, is widely used in Sri Lanka. There's also the withdrawal or pullout method, which is extensively used. That's one of the most popular methods among the nomadic Bedouin tribes of the Middle East. So this has been a brief survey. It's not exhaustive. There are hundreds of other examples I could have gone over, but I hope it gives the impression that there are many different methods of birth control that have been practiced by diverse human populations across the world for thousands of years. So this was a very important part of their culture to practice these birth control techniques in order to space out their, their young and allow them to better take care of their young with the resources available. So the effect of these widespread birth control practices is that it caused hunter-gatherer groups to have very low population sizes and low population densities. And if you look at a snapshot of the world from 3000 BCE, what you find is that for most of the world, so for the Americas, for Africa, for Australia, for some regions of, of Asia, population densities are very low. You do have these very dense centers in Europe, the Middle East, and particularly Asia, but the rest of the world is at low density. And this isn't because people are not there. People had already spread by this point across the Americas and Africa and Australia. It's just that the societies who occupied that land tended to maintain themselves at low population densities because of these practices uh, that I've gone over. So what kind of density are we talking about here? So according to a study of 94 hunter-gatherer groups, <clears throat> median popula population density was 0.47 people per square mile. And I live in Palmdale, California, so just to give a 
a uh, comparison, Palm, Palmdale's population density is more than 3,000 times higher than what you'd find in typical hunter-gatherer groups. And this can be even more extreme, so the capital of the Philippines, Manila, has a density 230,000 times greater than a typical hunter-gatherer group. And in this table here, you can see some comparisons of various regions compared to a typical density, a median density of hunter-gatherers of 0.47. So this evidence shows us that humans are fundamentally capable of living sustainably off their local resources for thousands of years. And one of the problems I find when I teach environmental biology and talk about population is that a lot of students think about our modern population and our population trajectory as something that's beyond our control, as something that will happen and we just have to respond to it. But what this evidence shows us is that our population size, what happens with our population is something that we have controlled in the past and we can control now. Continued growth into the future is not just some inevitability. Based on what happens in the future, how we affect fertility, how we affect birth rate, that completely changes the trajectory of, a, of our global population going forward. And the reason why population is so important is because every environmental problem that we have is a function of our population size. So as our population has gone up, for example, cumulative deforestation around the world has also risen until we've reached our current point where we've deforested about half of the world's forests. As population has risen, so has global carbon emissions. So the more people that you have, the more vehicles you have, the more industry you have, the more land has to be dedicated to agriculture and overall more carbon emissions. As population has risen, so has the number of extinctions. Until now, it's estimated that we've passed you know, 50,000 extinctions around the world and continuing to rise. Most of these extinctions are due to habitat loss, due to replacing wild lands with agricultural lands. And the more people that you have, the more land you have to set aside for agriculture to feed that population. As we've increased our population, we've also increased total freshwater usage around the world. And our freshwater usage globally is not sustainable. We are pulling more water out of aquifers at a faster rate than at the rate that they replenish. So this widespread use of birth control cross-culturally and the resultant stable and sustainable populations is really great news. This shows that unlike what a lot of people think, humans as a species are not broken. We are entirely capable of living within our means. And literally thousands of societies around the world have found cultural mechanisms to live within their means, to live sustainably with their local resources. So our future survival as a species is completely up to us and our actions. And I feel like these hunter-gatherer groups that were so successful at living within their means, of living sustainably, should be an inspiration to us for their self-control and, and wisdom into the future. Thank you. So here are my references. This is part one. I have quite a few references. I'll just leave this here. So if someone wants to pause it to copy down a, a reference, you can. So this is the first page. Here's page two of my references. Here's page three of the references. Page four. Is my picture sources, page one, picture sources. Okay, so when I did this talk at the Environmental Summit, I opened the floor to questions. And if anyone has questions, you could submit a question as a comment on the video. I'd like to hear from you. But yeah, thank you for checking out this video of my talk.